So we're going to start in chapter 25, verse 37. All right, that 27, not a 37. Really was going to mess you up that way. You want to mess Baptists up, tell them to open their Bible to the book of Hezekiah. That'll mess everybody up. Anyway, we're going to start in verse 27 and keep on with our saga of Isaac, Rebecca, and their boys. So verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I'm famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die, so what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. He ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So we fast forward from their birth to now they're grown men. And uh, one of the things we need to remember as we study this portion of Genesis and the, the rest of it to come is that Moses wrote this. And Moses wrote this so that the Israelites that he was leading out of Egypt going to the promised land would have a written history of what had happened. Primarily to show them God's promises and God's faithfulness to them as they were on their journey. And so that's what we can learn from it too, is to see God's plans, his purposes, his promises. And to know that in spite of us, in spite of humans, his plans will not be thwarted. And so there are four main characters in this portion of Genesis. We're going to see are at times pretty boneheaded. And so we're going to get to learn a lot about uh, everybody, but really Rebecca. But Rebecca's part of it too. We'll get to her probably on the 20th. But if you want to start, we'll just start here. Uh, one thing to remember too is that, uh, of course, we know that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth, that those peoples became the Israelites. Esau's people became the Edomites. The Edomites and the Israelites despised each other with, uh, with an intense, especially the Edomites had a very intense hatred for uh, the Israelites. And throughout Israel's history, the Edomites always gave them problems. One case in point was in Numbers, as the Israelites are trying to get into the promised land, they wanted to cut across Edom to save time. And the Edomites said, no way, we're not going to let you do it. Another thing, and I didn't know this until I was researching this, Herod the Great, one of the kings of Israel, so to speak, was not a Jew, but he was an Edomite. And so some of the animosity that the Israelites had toward the government in Jesus' day were because of this king. So there's always been a conflict from this point forward between these two nations. And our story tonight is not designed to show Jacob, not only to show Jacob as the chosen son through whom God would fulfill his purposes, but also it gives us an example of how not to live. The Bible is actually pretty good at showing us examples of how not to live. One of the cool things, I think, is it shows the patriarchs of our faith all the way through the Old Testament, the apostles, and other followers of Jesus, they weren't perfect people. They messed up, just like we mess up. But God still used them, God forgave them, and used them to accomplish his purposes. Uh, the one thing that... Uh, one of the central truths of this passage is that we shouldn't forfeit something of eternal value for something of temporal value. We should not live according to the f passions of our flesh, but rather we should live according to the promises of God. And to see how this plays out, we're going to look at the character of the two main characters, which is Jacob and Esau. 
Uh, from their birth, like I said, we fast forward to this point, and we get to see just how different the boys really are. They're not identical twins, they're fraternal twins, and they grew up with very different personalities, very different interests, and things like that. We learn from our text that Esau became an accomplished outdoorsman, skilled in hunting and tracking. He knew how to lay in wait for game and knew how to use the weapons that he had to ensure success. Scripture speaks of him of a beast of a field and is talking about a wild or untamed animal. Esau is called a man of the field, which suggests that in every real sense, he was a wild man. He was more concerned with adventure and sport than anything else. And remember, his name was given to him because he was hairy all over when he was born. He's a wild man both in how he acts and how he looks. He didn't care what people thought. He didn't care how he smelled. He didn't care how others perceived him. He was very uncultured and quite brutish in all likelihood. He was his own man, rugged, tough, and the kind of man who sees what he wants and takes what he wants. When he sees what he wants, he takes it, regardless of what anyone thinks. Now, as you know, I grew up in Texas. I know people almost as bad as Esau. When deer season starts or duck season starts, I know men and women who forsake everything and go to the deer camp or the duck camp, and they just stay there in pursuit of their prize. They don't care how they look. They don't care how they smell. All they're after is their prize. And they don't care what they wear, but most of the time they're going to have some form of camo on, and it's pretty fun. Now, most of them return to normal when the season's over, and they return to society. But I have known a few people that just transition from hunting season to fishing season to hunting season to fishing season to be completely transparent. That's the way I grew up. My dad, I'm the oldest of three boys. I was old enough to go hunting and fishing with my dad a lot. And we hunted and fished with a passion, great fervor. But we were smart enough, we didn't, we were smart enough to get, not go completely feral. Because we knew mom wasn't gonna let us in the house until we cleaned up. And we had to go back home. Although I don't get to do much of either of these days, I still would a lot rather be outside in the middle of nowhere than inside. And God in his sense of humor has me sit in the office most of the time, which I totally don't understand. But Jamie and I have been blessed to live in some very pretty places, live with nature. Our last house, we had deer that came up almost every evening. We had wild turkey running around. We had squirrels, all kinds of birds, and a bobcat and coyote that showed up from time to time. And we have learned to really appreciate the desert. So we enjoy living here too. On the flip side of this, Jacob is presented as a peaceful man, a tent dweller. The word peaceful here in the New American Standard is literally translated to mean complete and upright. It's the same word that the Bible uses to describe Job in the book of Job. And so... Uh, he's the opposite of his brother. Jacob's a dweller in tents. In other words, it suggests that he's a shepherd, a herder of goats and sheep. And verse 28 is very straightforward and tells us both Isaac, tells us both Isaac favored Esau and why he favored him. Isaac's preference was not based on anything but his love for game meat. It wasn't about Esau being the manly man, being the oldest by a few seconds. It had nothing to do with his character, being a loving son, or anything else, but solely upon his ability to hunt and provide meat for his dad. That was it. He loved wild game meat. I can't blame him. I do too. Uh, somebody asked before, and I'd already planned to say, say this, one of the so-called perks of being a missionary in East Africa, especially way out in the middle of the bush, is that we had to hunt for our meat. So we hunted various types of antelope and 
brought them home. We hunted warthog. In, in spite of their looks, warthog eats incredibly well. They are a very dangerous animal because of their tusk. So you never approach one until you know he's dead, which usually meant a finishing shot of some kind to his head. But uh, anyway, we had to process our own meat. My son was uh, four when we went over. After the first hunting trip, we're cutting up meat and doing everything, and of course he wants to help. So I give him a knife, and my wife said, he'll cut his finger. I said, yep, he'll do it once. And he cut his finger once. But we all enjoyed the meat. We, uh, the meat was incredibly lean, and uh, war warthog sausage and gravy is one of the best things you ever put in your mouth, I promise you. But uh, I've skinned a lot of animals in my time, and uh, even now, our holiday Christmas meals always involve some type of venison. So we still like it. Isaac loved Esau because he could supply him with his favorite food. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Uh, it does not say that she loved him because he was a shepherd or was more peaceful or more contemplative. It simply says she loves him more. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There was division in the family with each parent favoring, favoring a different child, one because of what he did and the other because of who he was. No doubt Rebecca had not forgotten what God had told her about the younger son, that he was the chosen one, the one whom God would use to extend the lineage. And he was preordained uh, to be blessed, and he was preordained to be used to carry forth the godly lineage. Um, that had to be part of her mindset about him. But in showing a family that is far from functional, far from being a happy family, a united family, um, God still used them to accomplish his purposes. Uh, Esau lived by what he felt, lived with his emotions, lived for the rush of adrenaline. Jacob was more contemplative, more, uh, but he was much more manipulative, manipulative, as we shall see, and more deceptive. And I think it's always the quiet ones that you've got to keep an eye on. So it always worked well for me. In showing that the humans, uh, that these patriarchs were human, God assures us that he can use fallen people to accomplish his perfect plan so we can have confidence he can use us. Then in verse 27 and 28, we get more into our verse, uh, yeah, 28, 29. Verse 29, we get into the drama. When Jacob had cooked a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Uh, we get the idea that uh, from this text that we can kind of read into it that he's not, Jacob's not at home cooking. Had he been at home and Esau comes in, there would have been somebody else cooking. Instead, Jacob is out probably watching his shepherds and their sheep and goats graze from pasture to pasture. Now, in the heat of the day, being Jacob's, uh, Isaac's son, he didn't have to stand out in the heat of the day. He would usually take a tent. They would take a tent for the son of the owner to sit in when it's really hot. And so Jacob's out. We believe from this text that he knew exactly where Esau went hunting. And he had in his mind he was going to lay a trap for his brother. So he's in the tent cooking. Esau comes in from hunting, and the trap starts to be sprung. Jacob made it his business to know where his brother would be. He knew his brother would be hungry, and he was going to take full advantage of his brother. So the curtain starts to rise on this drama as it starts to unfold, and uh, the stew that he was cooking was probably, Scripture tells us, it was some type of lentil stew. Uh, they called it some red stew, and it probably tasted very good, smelled very good. It was a dish that he prepared specifically because it must have been one of Esau's favorite dishes. It appealed to his senses. It smelled good, tasted good, looked good, and all of these things were enhanced by the fact that Esau came in famished. 
And so all this is set, and here comes Esau in. Hairy, smelly, tired, dirty. He's famished with hunger and is driven by his immediate cravings for something to satisfy his hunger. Even the way he expresses his desire for food gives us more insight into his personality. There's no pretense or civility. There's no appreciation for the quality of food or the preparation of the food. He simply wants his appetite to be satisfied. Basically, he says he wants to cram the food down his throat to satisfy his hunger. But here Jacob, instead of being a loving brother, going to provide for his older brother, instead of being hospitable, he starts his premeditated plan of action to trap his brother. He set the trap. The trap is about to be sprung. He says, first sell me your birthright. Had to be premeditated. That just didn't come upon him on a whim. To which Esau says, I'm starving. What good is my birthright to me? I just need some food. I need it now. Take it. It's not doing me any good. Here's an example of why we should not make major decisions when we're tired and hungry. Never works out real well. Esau was driven by what he felt, and he makes a decision he will later regret. Now, one of the things we can observe from this, because Jacob made him swear, is that there were other people around to hear Esau swear. Other people were witnesses, and so the oath that Esau took was binding. Had he been, again, we think he's not at his home. Had there been people from the home tent there, they probably would have tried to talk Esau out of it. But nobody did. And so uh, Esau swears an oath, and it's binding. In simple language, Esau swore to him and sold him his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And then the scripture tells us he ate, he drank, he rose, and went on his way. Even the very use of the t verbs in the Bible here is telling. He ate, he drank, he rose, he went on his way, speaks to his nonchalance, in which he sold his birthright, saying his birthright is no big deal to him. The irony of this story is that Esau, the hunter, became the hunted and Esau became the prey. He fell into Jacob's trap just as he would snare animals. And Jacob, the quiet one, had set a very smart trap, and it worked to perfection. Now, any actions, there's always some consequences. So the consequences of this, basically, uh, on the surface, it may be, appears to be just a simple transaction between two brothers. But it's much, much more than that. One got the better of the other, but there's a lot more going on, and we'll talk, kind of explain that as we go on. In the ancient world, the firstborn son uh, was born into a position of greater privilege than his brothers. He was born with a birthright, a right that was his by virtue of being born first. He did nothing to earn this. It had nothing to do with anything he had, it would uh, merit. It was simply by he was born first. Sort of like us in some ways, because when we're born again, we receive an inheritance. We receive an inheritance from our Lord. And we're born into the Spirit and the kingdom of God. And we didn't do anything to earn that. It was all Jesus. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind. Back then, in Esau's, in the day Esau lived, the birthright consisted of three things. First, it gave him the right to rule the family as the patriarch once his father died. Thus, it was a position of authority. Secondly, secondly, it gave him a double portion of the inheritance. I'd say there were three boys. They would split the inheritance into four pieces. Esau would get two pieces. The other brothers would get one piece. So it was a position a blessing that he gave up as well. Finally, by being the oldest son, he had to, when his dad died, he would become the family priest, the family mediator, so to speak, between them and God. And so he gave that up as well. So for a bowl of lentil stew to satisfy his physical appetites, 
Esau was willing to forfeit his role as a leader of the clan, his double portion of his father's estate, and gave up his priestly privileges. All for a bowl of stew. Hmm. He was oblivious to the future. All he could see and think about was the present and took no thought of the consequences of his actions. Just like so many foolish people do today, they don't think about their actions. They're only ruled like he was by his appetite. It was not only Esau who was wrong here. Jacob was also wrong. He was presumptuous. He was presumptuous by taking matters into his own hand and coming up with a plan to deceive his brother. And we know later that he will deceive his father with his mother's help. But by deceiving his brother and basically circumventing God's plan, God's will of how he would provide Jacob with this birthright and continuance of the lineage of Abraham. Uh, But scripture will reveal, just like we know, you can run but you cannot hide from the consequences of your sin. There would be consequences for Jacob. He would run from his brother's wrath just like he was a criminal fleeing the law, afraid to come home. Once he left, he would never again see his beloved mother. He would be cheated by Laban, who's his mother's brother, and he would work for seven years for a woman that he didn't love and have to work seven more years for the woman he did love. And he was deceived by Laban. He would live his life looking over his shoulder, always wondering if Esau was waiting around the next corner to exact revenge. Sin of every kind has its accompanying accompanying, uh, consequences. But there's a word of caution here for us as well. In verse 34b, Then Jacob gave Esau bread in lentil stew. He ate and drank, rose, and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Despising his birthright is something that Esau made a mistake on and something we need to be careful about. It's the same, despised is the same word that the prophet Nathan used in confronting King David about his sins of murdering Uriah and taking Bathsheba as his wife. It's also the same word Isaiah used in Isaiah 53 when he speaks of the Messiah was despised and and we esteemed him not It means to regard with contempt or to place no value on something. In this case, it's something of inestimable value. Esau's judgment was warped, loving that which could not last over that which would endure forever. And one writer said it was kind of like choosing a happy meal over your kid's life. As, a, as one who's been born of the Spirit of God, you and I have a birthright. As I mentioned, you're a child of God and have been chosen to receive the richest blessings of God. We did not earn it. We did not deserve it. It was granted to us by our birth into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's yours to use or lose. Like Esau, we've been given a position of authority. You are a co-heir to the very throne of God. You've been chosen to reign with Jesus throughout eternity. And as Pastor Calvin said this past Sunday, I don't think we can even fathom what that phrase means. Chosen to reign with Jesus throughout eternity. That, that still kind of gets me. Your birthright has entitled you to blessings beyond compare. Yes, the place Jesus has prepared for you is so splendid. The streets are paved with gold, but the greatest riches that you and I have been chosen to receive are not just physical, they are spiritual. God himself has chosen to come and reside within us. We can walk in fellowship and have a relationship with him, the creator of the universe, and he's promised to give us wisdom, discernment, knowledge, and peace. The depth and breadth of God's spiritual blessings and riches are ours to take. They are a part of our birthright. And in addition to that, he's chosen us to be a a kingdom of priests, a priesthood which means we can serve him. We can tell others about him and help participate in his kingdom work. The warning to us 
against the temptation is to not be like Esau and not regard this and to relinquish this. And if you want to flip over, I will, to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. Hebrews 12, 14 through 17. The writer of Hebrews addresses this. It says in verse 14, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see, and sanctification which no one will see the, I can't even, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and it, by it many be defiled, that there are no immoral godless persons like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it in tears. We need to be careful and not do what Esau did. He forfeited his birthright, forfeited his place and position for a bowl of soup. Seems pretty foolish. And yet there is no passage in all of Scripture that speaks more clearly or pointedly to the church of Jesus Christ today than this text does. All around us there are Christians who are selling that which is incalculable for a veritable bowl of soup. Many have sold their birthright to satisfy their appetite for pleasure. Others have sold their birthright to satisfy their appetite for power, possessions. While, they, while we will point a finger at Esau, and call him foolish, there are many Christians who are blinded and cannot see what they're doing to their own life. Like Esau, these people should know better, yet they sell their birthright, their spiritual inheritance, for the things of this world, for a bowl of soup. How many people calling themselves Christians have abandoned their devotion to Christ in favor of the desires of the faith, their uh, desires of the flesh? I can really honestly look back over my time in ministry, my time before I was in ministry, when I was a deacon, very active in a church, and tell you I've seen a lot of people who've walked away from faith in God because of a desire for someone, something, power, position, just pick one. They sold their birthright for a bowl of soup. They've even known uh, several preachers, several ministers, and a couple of missionaries who did the same thing. All for a bowl of soup. They basically ruined their lives. They were lured by the appetites of the flesh instead of pursuing God. Too many Christians today spend their life in pursuit of temporal things like money and pleasure, having abandoned the weightier things of the kingdom of God. How many of them have give, given themselves over to the head, hedonism of our day, becoming like the world around them, desiring to satisfy their flesh rather than desiring to satisfy God? In churches and denominations around the world, people are gathering themselves preachers and teachers who will tickle their ears, tell them what they want to hear, tell them it's okay to do these things because it's part of our culture. Instead of telling them the word of God and shooting straight with them. Fortunately, we have a pastor that shoots about as straight as anybody I've ever heard. And he does, doesn't pull any punches. Uh, we've also seen because of this that many of the mainline denominations in our country and Europe have fallen by the wayside, lost their power, lost their influence. Like Calvin preached about Sunday, like the church of Laodicea, they weren't persecuted because they compromised and gave in to the culture. They were no threat to the culture. And too many denominations, too many Christians have done that today. We have to be careful. We have to be alert so that we don't get caught up in all this. 
We have to be very aware of the birthright we have as followers of Christ. We know from this story the way it affected Esau, and we will learn as we continue to study the Bible that his descendants were also impacted. And like we talked about at the beginning, they became arch enemies, godless enemies of the Jews, and ultimately the purposes of God. We need to learn that sinful decisions, that if, uh, our sinful decisions affect other people and can from generation to generation to generation. No one sins in a vacuum, and there are always consequences to our sin. Kind of a hard one. And now, we'll go shift gears. I took my clock down. All right, we're good. We're going to shift gears and look at a story about Isaac in chapter 26, the first 22 verses. And we're going to see another one of our patriarchs that messes up. So I'm going to read through verse 1 through 22 of verse chapter 26, Genesis. Now there was a famine in the land. Sound familiar? Think back a little bit to his daddy. A famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerhar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For you, to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and will give you descendants of all these lands. By, give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my char charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac lived in Gerar. When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill him on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. It came about that when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, certainly she is your wife. How did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, because I said I might die on account of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of our people might have easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him, and he became rich and continued to go richer until he became very wealthy, for he had possessions of flocks and herds, a great house and a great household, so the Philistines envied him. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said, Isaac, go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Then Isaac dug wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He gave them the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug, dug in the valley and found there a well, a, a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerhar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, there is, The water is ours. So he named the well Essek, because they contended with him. They dug another well, and they quarreled over it too. So he named it Sitna. He moved away from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he named it Rehoboth. For he said, at last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. This is kind of an odd little chapter sandwiched in between the saga between uh, Jacob and Esau. In fact, uh, this is the only chapter in Genesis devoted entirely to Isaac. Kind of weird. Abraham had 12 chapters, Jacob is going to have 12 chapters, and Jake, Joseph had another 12 chapters, but Isaac just has one. So again, remember, this is Moses writing the history 
writing God's story so the Israelites would know not only that their leaders sometimes messed up, but also knew the faithfulness of God to his promises to Abraham and to the following generations. And we can learn from this as well. One of the things we need to, there's a few things to learn, but one of the things we need to think about from this is that even when we do what God wants us to do, we're going to hit obstacles. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be hurdles we have to get over. And while this is a misconception and a misrepresentation of Scripture by many in our world today who will tell you that surrendering your life to God Accepting Jesus as your Savior will guarantee you a life of free of troubles, pain, and obstacles. This is not what the Bible teaches, neither in the Old Testament or the New Testament. This is merely wishful thinking by those who preach and teach, and reality is extremely deceptive and harmful because some of the people that buy into this health and wealth gospel and start to live their life believing that's what it's going to be, and life doesn't turn out to be a bed of roses, they become angry at God. They become angry at the church. And many of them walk away from the church and never want anything to do with it again. The Bible is very clear in showing us the lives of the people in the Old Testament who were following God's plan and had difficulties. The New Testament is even more clear in the teachings of our Lord and the writings in the epistles, that we will have problems when we follow God. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice in exaltation. The New Testament is very clear on this fact. Our text shows us today how this happens in the life of Isaac. So we're going to note a few things about the obstacles. Sometimes there's obstacles that are God's direction. What happened in the land? There was a famine. Now, God could have made it rain. He could have made the grass grow so the sheep and goats could have had plenty to eat. He could have made the crops grow with rain, but he didn't. There was a famine. And he used this famine to test Isaac and to grow his faith. And so he sent him to a place where he had to depend upon God and not depend on himself. Folks, that's a great place to be. And when we learn the lesson we have to depend on God and not ourselves is a great lesson. I've been in full-time ministry since 1991. That's a long time ago. And I can assure you this type of test where you have to depend upon God and you're not yourself is very real. It's also one of the most valuable lessons any of us can learn in our walk with God because we have a strong tendency to believe there's nothing we cannot do, cannot handle, if we put our minds to it. This is elemental in human nature for the most part, but as, but as Americans, it's almost innate to us. We think there's nothing we can't do if we put our minds to it. The problem with this is that we all face situations, tests, trials, obstacles, where we need more than our determination to get through it. We need God. We need his help. We need his direction, his strength, his power, his grace. One of the things that uh, I've, you've heard me probably say this, and I'm going to say it until I cannot speak. The greatest lesson that Jamie and I learned as missionaries living in the middle of nowhere in Tanzania was, was that when Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth, he really meant it. We lived on the edge of the end of the earth. Our missionaries used to joke, you may have heard me say this, our missionaries used to joke that we lived so far out in the bush that you could go to the edge of the earth and look over the edge, and that's where we live. That's about right. Way out in the middle of nowhere. Days from tarmac. Didn't have too many visitors come to see us either. 
But God bless the work, the time that we were there in the bush. Uh, there are many situations we faced as missionaries, as ministers, in churches, and just life of its own self, where had it not been for God being with us, leading us, sustaining us, comforting us, empowering us, we would not be where we are now. This is a lesson each of us should learn. God sent Isaac to the Philistine territory. This is probably modern-day Gaza. He sends him back to the very place that Abraham, his father, had made himself unwelcomed. If you remember the story. He puts Isaac in a place where he could test his faith and teach Isaac some lessons on dependence. There are times in life that we all face that seems like the rug gets pulled out from under us when things don't go as planned. In those situations, we have a real tendency to become discouraged and even to panic at times. But for those of us who are saved, this is never the right response. For we need to understand that God, that God allows everything to happen that happens to us for his purpose. Romans 8, 28 is a very familiar passage. It is also a very true passage. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And if you remember, I quoted an old preacher last week who said this, In school we are taught lessons and then tested. In the Christian life we're tested and then taught the lessons. This is what God's doing with Jay, or, or Isaac in this passage. There are times God will allow our circumstances to seemingly dry up in one place so he can take us somewhere else, to a place he can position us to depend upon him and him alone. Sometimes we get so comfortable, God needs to bump us, kind of wake us up, to kind of shake us, to get us going again, to realize our dependence upon him. Here in Isaac's case, we see Isaac respond in fear rather than faith. Fear and faith are like oil and water. Sometimes you mix them together, but they just never do work. They're not compatible. And the second obstacle, the thing we can learn from the obstacles um, is, another, is that the obstacles which come as real as a result of our own actions. In other words, there are consequences to our actions. One lesson I really harped on when my kids were old enough to know right from wrong is that there are consequences to your actions. Still harp, at, start, still harp on it to them at times. Now I'm working on my grandkids. Sometimes they got it, so other times they didn't. And when they didn't, they had to live with the consequences, just like I have to live with the consequences when I make bad decisions. In our text, we see Isaac and Philistine, and the Philistines were ruled by King, King Abimelech. Now, if you remember back to Abraham's time in Philistine, 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 whatever it is, uh, there's also King Abimelech. This is probably his son and not uh, the one Abraham dealt with. But we see history repeat itself, or I should say bad decisions and bad choices repeat themselves, in that Isaac does the very exact thing his dad had done. He tells everybody his wife is his sister because he's scared. He's scared for his own hide. He's afraid that if he knew it was his wife, that somebody would kill him. Or uh, if it was, yeah, and take her for his own. But he gets caught fooling around with his wife. And so the secret's out, and a confrontation ensues. I kind of think that's kind of like father, like son. So the confrontation leads to an obstacle that is clearly a result of Isaac's disobedience, a result of lack of faith. Isaac's sin was not trusting God and letting God take care of him, protect him, and so he lied. By lying, Isaac professes unbelief that God can handle it. And as we live our lives, the temptation to live, to lie, is very real. Uh, sometimes we lie to protect ourselves, whether it's from a physical threat or to protect our image. Other times it's telling someone that w what they, we think they want to hear and not wanting to hurt their feelings and other reasons. There are many other reasons we lie and practice deception. I had this one missionary friend. I don't know if you know, if you've you ever been around people pleasers, they had to please people. That's what drove them. 
They're fun to mess with if you kind of figure out what to do. But anyway, I didn't mess with this guy. He was a missionary. He lived uh, about four hours from us. We had been through uh, appointed together. We'd gone through orientation together. We went through language school together. And then we lived about four hours apart. He was the absolute worst people pleaser I have ever known. He would lie to you, telling you what he thought you wanted to hear instead of telling the truth. It was almost funny at times because you knew when he's talking to you, he's lying to you. But he couldn't help himself. And so in a day or two, he'd come back around. He said, man, I lied to you. Forgive me. Yeah, yeah, we know. You need to work on this. And I don't know if he got it fixed or not, but he was the worst one I ever, I've ever been around. But I never will forget a piece of advice my father-in-law gave me. This was when I graduated college and went to work in the real world, not the church world, but the real world, corporate world. He told me that if I always told the truth, I would not have to remember all the stories that I made up and who I told them to. Never will forget that. But that's true. Always tell the truth. In Isaac's case, his sin made him unwelcome, an unwelcome guest in Philistine. And we can learn from this that many of the obstacles we face are not anyone else's fault but our own fault. Due to the decision we made or did not make, we reap the consequences of our actions as well as our inactions. Uh, another point about obstacles is obstacles can result in God's blessing. In this case, uh, God continued to bless Isaac, even though he had obviously messed up. But basically, he blessed Isaac because he had promised to bless Abraham and Abraham's descendants. The obstacle in Isaac's success was created by his sin because the Philistines became jealous of his success because of his wealth. No matter what Isaac planted or where his sheep and goats ate, he reaped an amazing harvest much larger than the Philistines. Their jealousy created problems for him and his people, and Abimelech asked him to move away. As Christians, we need to realize that obstacles are going to come our way. They are part of the package of following Jesus. Along life's journeys, as you fellowship with God and his people, you will face difficulties. Sometimes they're unexpected. Sometimes you can see them coming. Either way, obstacles will come. That's a fact. The question to answer is how do you handle these obstacles? Look at the way Isaac handled these. So in overcoming the obstacles in his life, he ran. He got away from Abimelech just like Abimelech had asked him to. Scripture tells us he departed and camped in the valley of Gerhar and settled there. Note the three things he did. One, he found the wells that his father had dug, that Abraham had dug, that the Philistines had covered up back in with dirt. And so he basically the point to this is we need to remember God's faithfulness in our past. God provided water for Abraham. Isaac went and found those wells, redug the wells, and water flowed. But then the Philistines stopped the wells up, had stopped the wells up after the passage told us after Abraham had died. So Isaac found these wells, digs them again, water flows, people are fed, livestock are sustained, plants grow, and he found the wells that God had blessed Abraham with. The point being, as we follow God and hit obstacles, we need to be able to look back in our own lives and remember the faithfulness of God when we encountered obstacles earlier in our lives. We need to remember the stories our parents and others have told of God providing and comforting in their lives. Our problems, too often times, is we have short-term memory when it comes to remembering what God has done. One of the things that I started doing many, many years ago, a long time ago, in fact, I think I was a junior in high school when I started, was when I encountered situations, obstacles, that were overwhelming at times. Sometimes it was a blessing. Sometimes it was all kinds of things. Reading the Bible 
the Bible spoke to me, and I would write whatever was going down on, how that, what that verse meant, the date, and kept it in my Bible. A few years ago, I went and picked out all my Bibles from high school and started going through them looking for these gems, these points of my past where God really showed up and made a difference. What I do? I typed them all up. They're taped in the back of every Bible I own now. These are faith markers. Times I can open this and I can look back to when I was 16 years old and one of my uncles died. And I've really read and understood Philippians 4.13 for the first time. Or at, uh, pick another one. At 33, from 33 to 41 years old, like I said earlier, Jesus promised he would be with us to the end of the age in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, to know him, the power of his resurrection. And I just kept doing this. And not long ago, I added another one. A great way to help us remember the times God's faithful to us. And I can't imagine what my kids are going to do after I'm gone. They're going to pull out this Bible or one of my Bibles and say, what does this mean? <laughs> and Jamie's going to be able to tell him. Actually, I'm probably going to outlive her, so I can... Oh, I didn't mean. <laughs> no, that's just teasing. But anyway, we need to be able to remember the times God really showed up in our lives in a big way, his faithfulness to us, to help us get through the obstacles and the diff different situations we face in life. The second thing we notice about Isaac in this text is he's persistent. Every time a well is dug, the Philistines show up. They take it away from him. He moves on. He digs another well. And finally, um, he just kept digging. And one of the reasons things should get accomplished in God's kingdom work that don't is because we usually give up too easily. God calls us to be persistent. Persistent in prayer, persistent in practice. We should never, ever give up. When we know as God has called us to do something, we should expect opposition, though. We should expect obstacles. In fact, opposition to God's work is a certainty, whether it's your personal walk or a corporate walk here as a church. Our response should not to be discouraged and quit, but to buckle up and dig in and keep on going. One of the conversations that Pastor Calvin and I started having probably late in 22 as the church was growing is knowing there were going to be some opposition, some obstacles that would come along and try to discourage us, try to defeat us, try to derail the opportunities and the vision that God is providing for our church. We know it will come. So he and I are very alert to this type of opposition, this type of obstacle. Hopefully we're spiritually prepared. We've both seen this multiple times in our ministries. And as you as church members, you should be prepared and alert as well. We should be able to handle the obstacles that come up, the spiritual warfare that comes up, that will come up as we continue to pursue what God wants for you and me in this church. Uh, then we see what Isaac does next as he digs new wells. Recognize when God is leading you to something new. Uh, you may have heard it said, been said a lot, the past is a great guidepost, but it makes a, should never be used as a hitching post. As Isaac moved on from the wells his father dug, he had to dig a new well for himself, one that would serve as a reminder of God's faithfulness in leading him. Abraham had laid a great foundation for future generations. The wells he had, had served as reminders of God's faithfulness to him. But as God leads Isaac to dig, new, dig a new well, 
He wants, you to mem- wants us to remember our past, but to use the past to continue to build upon the work he not only started, but continues into the present and beyond. Isaac named the new well Rehoboth, which means wide place, because God made room for them, allowing them to continue to be fruitful in the land. In this text, there are three things that we can learn about, four things, excuse me, four things we can learn about God. Who you follow is more important than where you go. God's leadership not where he leads us is of ultimate importance. When Jamie and I surrendered to be missionaries, the last place in my mind I wanted to go was Africa. In fact, growing up, my wife had told others that she never wanted to marry a preacher and she didn't want to marry a missionary to Africa. But God has a sense of humor. She got a double dose. Except I'm not the preacher. Whatever. Anyway, uh, we, all too often we want to focus on where God is leading us and ne- neglect the greater consideration of whether or not God, it is really God who is leading us. We can get pretty fired up and emotional at times about certain ministries and potential opportunities, and we are prone to take off and chase after these. Some of these opportunities are not from God. Case in point. We had been in Tanzania about six months, been in like, just got out of language school, so it was about six, seven months into our time there. We had a mission meeting. That's when all of our missionaries got together and we had guest speakers. Uh, people from the States came out and did vacation Bible schools for our kids. It was a great time getting to see everybody, getting to know everybody. And one of the bosses was there. And he said, we need some help. We need some volunteers. Volunteers to do what? to go to Mogadishu, Somalia, and help with the relief work that was going on in Mogadishu at the time. Man, that moved me. And I said, went up to him later and I said, I'll go. He said, no, Ward, you've been, you haven't been here long enough to know what you're talking about. And he was right. But emotionally, I was ready to go. Go help people. But he was wise enough to stop me and say, you need a little more experience before you go to Mogadishu. And he was right. I would have just probably got in trouble there. Um, but we need to pay attention to what God, to make sure and pray through the, uh, where we believe God is leading us and taking us, just so we discern and know it's really him and not just some emotional thing that we're experiencing. We need to be diligent in Bible study, and we need to ask God for discernment when we see these opportunities before us. Second thing is God's blessings on us, and God's blessing on us in spite of us, not because of us. Verses 3 and 5, God tells Isaac that he will bless him because of Abraham. Had Isaac got what he deserved, he would have suffered the consequences of lying to the king. But many of God's blessings are not conditioned upon our actions. Many, in fact, most of them are a result of the promises he made long before you and I were born. God's blessings on you and me as Christians is not because of anything we've done. We've been blessed with forgiveness of sin. We've been adopted into the family of God. We have been dwelling in the Holy Spirit and the promise of eternal home, not because of anything that you and I have done, all because of Jesus and his obedience to his Father and going to the cross. Third thing is God is a God of provision. Where he guides, he provides. Where he leads, he meets our needs. We notice that every time the Philistines fill in a well, Isaac digs a new well and provides water. This is God's provision. This is God providing in spite of surrounding opposition and in spite of circumstances. You may have heard it said, the safest place in the world is in the will of God, for the will of God will not lead you, or the grace of God can't provide for you. One of the verses that I have written down in my book, on my back page, is Philippians 4.19. A verse that came, became very real to me as, as a missionary, as a business administrator and executive pastor of churches. And the verse says, And my God shall supply all of your needs 
according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Folks, I've been in churches where there's times the budget's been pretty tight, wasn't a lot of money in the bank, and prayer, and depending upon God to provide, was the only option we had. We've never missed a payroll. We've never not paid a bill in my however many years I've been doing what I do. God has always provided. This, and, uh, this verse always reminds me that irregardless of circumstances that are going on in my life and around me, that I can always, always count on him. The last one's a very important one, and that is God is faithful. One thing we need to learn, consider and learn as we read the Bible, as we read these stories in the Old Testament, as we read the book of Acts and the epistles, is God is faithful, period. We can depend upon him. He was faithful to Abraham, Isaac, to Israel, and he will be faithful to you and me. All we have to do is to follow him in obedience. Like the old song says, we just need to trust and obey. For there's no other way. Be, and to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. We can enjoy his fullness, his blessings, the blessings that are afforded us through our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior.